I moved to Soho because very early on I saw some showings of underground film that Jonas Mikas was organizing. Uh -huh. And I and my wife, my first wife, were totally wiped out by that. And I spent the next, I don't know how many years, going to Jonas's screenings mm -hmm. at least five nights a week. Mm -hmm. And through Jonas, I got to know George Machunas, ah. who of course set up the first 13, 15 co-ops in Soho. Right. And for a while, I actually worked for George, Did you? helping to build Jonas's first Cinematheque here on Worcester Street. And I was scared to move down here because it was illegal and everything else. So finally, I decided, well, I'll take the plunge. You know, it wasn't Soho in those days. Mm -hmm. It was just a, 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 an area of light industrial factories and things. And uh, people were starting to move here because they could get cheap space. Mostly, I'm convinced, George. George Machunas was the one who made it happen. And he but m mostly appealed to artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it was not thought of particularly as an aesthetic move. It was not thought of as an aesthetic community. Mm -hmm. It was thought of as a place where artists who didn't have much money could move cheaply. Now, as George always pointed out to me, he would say to me, Richard, you know, most of the people who move into my co-ops are not very wonderful people because they're spoiled people who come from rich families that can afford to buy this space. Right. And uh, however, most of them were in one way or another artists. Mm -hmm. And the community grew after that as performances started happening. Jonas's theater on, down lower on Worcester Street was one of the first places that happened. And indeed, he uh, said, well, you know, we're showing film, but why don't you take charge of being the manager uh -huh. of whatever theatrical performances or other kinds of performances come through here? Uh -huh. So in those early days, I remember I would, I mean, I wasn't responsible for making it happen, but I was in charge of getting Trisha Brown into that space. Uh -huh. Phil Glass and Steve Reich gave their first public concert, I believe, in that space. And all kinds of other things like that happened. Where was it? It was at 80 Worcester Street. Oh, yeah, where he lived, in the basement. Yeah, George lived in the basement there. I remember meeting his mother. Yeah, his mother was there a lot. And, of course, George fought with the um, attorney general from there uh -huh. and did all kinds of crazy things. That, uh, uh -huh. And at a certain point, the fire department closed uh, Jonas's movie theater because George had designed this theater, which, again, I helped to build. And they said, you can't show films here. You don't have a license. You don't have this. So Jonas came to me and he said, well, I know you want to make plays, Richard. I can't show films here. But they didn't say we couldn't do theater. So you take the theater and put on your plays here. Uh -huh. So for three years, Jonas gave me this space to put on plays. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, is this a co-op? And how did that oh, happen? Sure, how, did that, sure. how did that happen? Well, George would just, well, I, that, okay. George would set up these co-ops. What happened on this occasion was I went to George and I said, George, I think I'm ready to move down here. And George rubbed his hands together and said, OK, we'll get 10 other people and we'll buy a building. And he did it. I don't know how he got, gathered the people. A few years later, I decided I needed a theater down here. Mm -hmm. and George said, no problem. We'll buy another building. <laughs> and of course, it cost in those days $10,000 to buy the space. And then it cost another 6000 to hire George's army of starving artists to redo the place, put in the plumbing, put in the walls, do everything that, because this particular building was a doll factory. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. And, uh... and I must say that in this building, for instance, uh, mm, at least 60% of the people are still here from the beginning. Yeah. But in this building, as in all others, George was wonderful and a selfless yeah. person, but people didn't understand him. And he had a sort of arrogance at times. He got in fights with every building, and he was thrown out of every building. You know, because he, he, the deal was he took a loft space on the ground floor to use that for income and so forth. He got thrown out of every one of them. It was really horrible. Yeah. Can you, uh, uh, so what was it like to walk around? What was it like to walk around Soho at that time? Well, it was much... It was deserted. It wasn't deserted. I mean, there was manufacturing going on, light manufacturing, small little workers' restaurants. Mm -hmm. I, mean, it need, I mean, as everybody knows, it was a totally different world. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, everybody who's been here that long, of course, is horrified by the way it is now. Mm -hmm. you know. and, and so when was your co-op actually formed, and how does that work? 
Oh, I don't remember. It was formed from the beginning. I mean, George had a lawyer, and we drew up the papers, and everybody signed. Mm -hmm. And it, it just happened mm -hmm. easily at that point, even though it was illegal to live here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have tremendous nostalgia for all the years I lived in Paris. Uh -huh. But, you know, I never liked New York that much. Uh, obviously, Soho was a bearable place in New York. But nostalgia, no. No, not really. What made it bearable? Oh, well, it was that epoch when we all believed that the world was changing. You know, we all believed we were making a new kind of art. There were drugs. I did not. I was scared to take drugs. I took very little drugs. I took them occasionally when people snuck them into my brownies or something, and I didn't know. Uh -huh. But uh, there was a general atmosphere that everything was possible and everything was changing. And we really believed that. Mm -hmm. And I was helping Jonas organize, trying to raise money for underground filmmakers, and um, mm -hmm. it was a different time in general in New York, and I felt it was the one time that I breathed freely mm -hmm. uh, in America, mm -hmm. not only uh, yeah. Soho. Yeah. So I didn't identify the freedom of that time with Soho as much as I did with the movement of underground culture in America. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was the most glorious time in America. And of course, then it horrified me in the 90s when people started talking again about how horrible it was back in the 60s in America. My God, it was the, it was the best time ever in America.